So welcome, everyone. Uh, today is June 16th. Thank you, Jen. Uh, today is Father's Day. So before we even begin, uh, two things. Sound check. Everything, everything coming through okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Susan. So today is Father's Day. So if you have not yet wished your father, uh, wish your father a happy Father's Day. If you don't have a father, think about who takes up that place in your life. Uh, I know that when my mom passed away, I started uh, telling my dad Happy Mother's Day on Happy Mother's Day because I figure now he's all I have left. So he's got to do double duty, right? He's got to do Happy Mother's Day and Happy Father's Day. So, you know, I just, uh, he just gets lots of, lots of love because, you know, I'm the last of six kids. So that was a lot of work. I can tell you, we put him to the test for sure many a time. So, well, welcome. This is Lions Roar Dharma Center. I'm Sharla Smith. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a student of Lama Jimpa. And this is unusual for me. I never present sitting down and I never have notes, but I've watched y'all. I've watched y'all. So, you know, I've learned. So I'm actually going to present seated, which is very weird. And I'm actually going to have notes and not 20 foot tall uh, PowerPoint slides. Also very weird, but we're going to go with it. So here we go. So this was, a uh, my talk is, uh, uh, Rinpoche and I talked a lot during uh, the recent time that we had where we had uh, some threats to the Dharma Center. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I have a lot of experience with that. And so we talked a lot about it. And he said, you need to give this talk. And I said, I don't know how to give this talk. It's just lived experience. And I'm not sure how I would couch that in uh, Buddhist practice. And so I started kind of rolling it around in my head and then having Darshan uh, with uh, Rinpoche. And I said, oh, I know, I know what I do. You know how you do something so often you forget that you do it, right? And I said, I know what I do. I couch everything into the four Brahma Viharas. So as I started to think about that, then I'm like, all righty, maybe I can give this talk. So let me zip to the back because I see y'all are, y'all are super fancy and give your references. So I'm going to give those first and then we're going to jump in. So I looked at Awakening Loving Kindness by Pema Children. You all know. Uh, I freely admit to you I'm in the process of moving. And so these were the books that I had on my nightstand. So they were easily accessible. The other ones are packed away, but this worked. Uh, Dalai Lama's Little Book of Wisdom, The Essential Teachings by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. It's tiny. Y'all should look at it. Uh, How to Love by Thich Nhat Hanh and The Compassionate Life by Dalai Lama. And then also I just did a general uh, search through Tricycle, Lion's Roar, uh, even my old Sangha, the new Kadampa tradition, just looking at some of the definitions of some of the, you know, Brahma Viharas and then kind of merge things together. Uh, to make sure that we get adequate definitions that work for us in this Sangha. So what was my event tagline? Did anyone read the event tagline in your email? Or are you guys like, lion's roar? No, you looked at it? Okay. I, I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm going to tell you what I said. <laughs> Ever hear that saying, how you do anything is how you do everything, right? So for example, it, do you get up every day? Do you make your bed? Or do you just get up and go, it's good. I'll sleep in it later, right? It, it's how you do everything, right? Like, do you, you know, do you fold your clothes? Do you take them out of the dryer and you're like out of the laundry basket and you dump them in a pile and you're like, that's cool. That's where the clean clothes are. I will dig through that pile, right? So it's how you do anything is how you do everything, which is going to come back to, you know, bite us in these four Brahma Viharas. Are you ready? So I say it's true. Let's parse out the four Brahma Viharas and discover practices that one can engage in to help in the heat of the moment. Something to keep in our toolbox to call upon when needed. In other words, let's talk about the how of Buddhism, right? It's, it's very easy to say, I'm a practicing Buddhist, but are you practicing, right? Or I'm Buddhist good for you. Are you doing something, right? Otherwise, it's just kind of, you know, empty words, right? So we're going to talk about that. So I keep a few quotes uh, at hand, because I feel like 
um, I'm going to be very, very open in this conversation. So uh, I was a, a really serious athlete for a number of number of years. And what you learn about being a very serious athlete is that you have a visual field. And in that visual field, you need to train yourself that you can do things that as of yet your body has not accomplished. I know. Are you ready? Are you guys still with me? So this means when I ran uh, cross country and track competitively, I would track my times for each event, each race. And at the end of Saturday, when I competed in an invitational, right? So many, many, many hundreds of people, I would take my time and depending on if it was a faster event or a, you know, distance event, I would up, I would decrease my time by maybe seconds, maybe tenths of seconds. And I would rewrite my times in order so that my mind knew what that represented, right? The two mile, the one mile, the 1320, the 880, the 440. I know, see, nerdy, uh, super nerdy. You just got to, you just got to roll with it, right? I'm super nerdy. So I would do that. And then I would attach that to the front of every school book, every folder, my mirror. So when I brush my teeth, I would stare at those times, right? My nightstand, get ready to turn off the light. Da, 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 those are the times, right? Everywhere I looked in my visual field, I would do that. And guess what? Every week, the new time that I wrote is exactly what I ran. Because I could convince my body that I could run a five-minute mile right? I could tell myself, I can run two consecutive five minute miles with a little sludge, right? You got to get kicked, you kick people, you know, so you go a little bit over on the two mile, but do you know what I'm saying? So you visually, this is really important for us. This is also why we do this. Look around, look around in here, look at this visual field. We do this for a reason, right? We do this. So we're inviting in all of these images, all of these things, we're inviting this in, we're making this very visual. So I bring all that up to tell you that I keep quotes everywhere in my visual field around my desk, around my bed, around my mirror, right? Because when you're brushing your teeth, you could stare at yourself or you could stare at something that's actually going to help you, right? So one of the quotes I keep really, really close to me is, and you'll see why in a second. The Buddha said, hatred will never cease by hatred. By love alone will it end. This is an eternal law. I keep that literally as close as the end of my nose. And you'll see why. So Everyone prior to me who I've watched for a little over the last year has said they have, they give their qualifications for giving the talk. Sorry, y'all. Here you go. These are my qualifications. <laughs> my qualifications are years of experience of facing extreme emotions and actions, sometimes quite violent in nature, from other people's bodies, speech, and minds. There is the pre Buddhist to be me. Oh, you guys are looking at me. I'll go that way. Pre-Buddhist me, right? That's where zero should be. And then now practicing Buddhist me, and it's quite a difference. So I'm going to do something very unusual, and I'm going to read you my short bio for work. This is my short one. I know it's weird because it's in the third person, but you just have to roll with it. Ready? Charlotte E. Smith, Master's in Public Health, is the Comprehensive Sexual Health Education Consultant with the California Department of Education, ensuring that the California Education Code regarding comprehensive sexual health education and HIV prevention education is implemented in accordance with the law. She provides consultation, training, technical assistance, and professional development on all matters relating to the primary prevention of HIV, STIs, and unintended pregnancy. She has been instrumental in the passage of numerous laws relating to sexual health and advancements for the LGBTQ plus community. Sharla began her career in public health in 1989 and has implemented health education projects in the area of sexual and reproductive health with a focus on adolescents and young adults. Sharla is an out proud member of the LGBTQ plus community. Okay. Let that soak in for a second. 
Now, can you see why through my professional career, I've had lots of experience with anger and violence? Yeah, people are nodding their heads. There are lots of people who don't like what I do and who seek to end me to end it. But that's not going to happen, right? And people are confused. People have mental health issues. People have suffered from misinformation, disinformation, right? And the pre-Buddhist me would think this person is trying to harm me. The Buddhist me says this person is suffering from delusions. This person, it's, it's, it's not who they really are. It's impermanence, right? So I've been practicing since 2009. And that, those first years were a good, big, giant, Sisyphean learning curve for me, right? Every day I would get the boulder and I would roll it up the hill and I would feel really good about what had occurred. And then I would look in the morning and I'm like, here's the boulder again. <laughs> And I'm like, what is the problem? The problem was the four Brahma Viharas. Are you ready? I'm going to talk about it and tell you how I solved it for myself. Can't solve it for you. Okay. So the four Brahma Viharas, and I can go into more detail if you want, but let's just, we can keep it at, I've had lots and lots of experience with very angry, very violent people. <laughs> and I'm really... Uh, Good or bad now, I'm very comfortable with that, and I'm very good at diffusing it, right? Very good at managing and diffusing. All the while, so I did not say hello to everyone online, but don't worry, you're going to have something to do later, y'all online folks. So the four Brahma Viharas. So as defined, right, uh, the four Brahma bi bi uh, Viharas are defined as the four abodes, right? Like abode as a home. But I crack up at Sharon Salzberg. We all know who she is. She defines the Brahma as in best and Viharas as in home, like your best home. But she talks about it as sometimes you're home and sometimes you're not. And that was a really hard thing for me to understand when I was first practicing Buddhism. I was like, I need to figure out a way to make these my home and to constantly keep them with me. So I finally decided I would just be a snail. <laughs> I would just create a little home and just keep it on my back. And I would have it with me all the time. And I would be like, I need loving kindness. I need compassion. I need equanimity. I need, right? And I would just pull it out of my little snail shell. And you just heard, I ran cross country and track. I'm not very snaily, but I got a little house, right? That I made on my back of the four Brahma Viharas. So that's how I think of it. I think of them like a snail shell a home that I can take with me wherever I go. So no matter what, I have them. So what are they? The four Brahma Viharas. Loving kindness, or in Pali, metta. Compassion, or in Pali, karuna. Sympathetic joy, mudita. And equanimity, uh, upekka. So let's do a little brief dive. And for all of you sitting that thinking you're going to be super comfy and just get to relax. We're coming out to you in a little bit. So just get your minds a thinking. So loving kindness. In Buddhism, loving kindness is not just an emotion, but it's a cultivated mental state in which our attention and concern are directed towards the happiness of others. The practice of metta or loving kindness is also an anecdote to selfishness and anger. I really love the whole juxtaposition of what's an anecdote to what's happening, right? Loving kindness is the sincere wish for the well being, happiness, and safety of all beings, including oneself. Here's the part people forget. Loving kindness involves cultivating a boundless and unconditional love that transcends all preferences 
all boundaries and all personal biases. Buddhist practitioners extend loving kindness towards all beings, regardless of their relationship or their behavior. Are y'all thinking back to those people who are always angry and yelling at me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So something key to remember is that we need to begin at home. Remember that whole idea of home again, right? My little snail shell. We need to begin at home with ourselves, meaning meta meditation. It usually begins by us offering loving kindness to your self. This seems contradictory since loving kindness is about concern for others, as I already discussed. But folks who are not at peace with themselves struggle to offer peace to others. Right? If you don't have it in here, you can't generate it for anybody else. Okay. So you have to begin with yourself. You have to practice kind, uh, loving kindness meditation for yourself. So you ready for another little snippet to put next to your bedside on your mirror when you brush your teeth? You can comb your hair and look at it. Just write down. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you live with ease. May you be safe. Yeah. Right? It has to start here. I can't generate that for anybody else outside of me if I don't feel it for me. Yeah. It's a hard concept to get because so often we're focused on, I'm going to be a bodhisattva. I'm going to do all these things for the outside, but you got to start here so that you can do that part. Okay. This is odd. I'm used to taking questions as I go, but I'm just going to keep talking. Y'all don't give me the mic. That's a bad idea. Okay. Compassion. Ready? Compassion. This is a core value in Buddhism that transcends sympathy or empathy, and that is aimed at alleviating suffering while fostering the interconnectedness and positive actions of all beings. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama states, by feeling compassion for others, our, for our own suffering, I'm sorry, I messed up our quote, by feeling compassion for others, our own suffering becomes manageable. Cultivating compassion is a practice that helps us overcome self-centeredness and develop a sense of interconnectedness. I'm going to pause on this word practice. I love this word practice. I'm a practicing Buddhist. That means some days I'm really good at it and some days I am really bad at it. It's kind of like my buddy is a doctor and she always says, hey, I'm practicing medicine. Doesn't mean I know everything. I'm practicing. I'm like, oh, that's scary and terrifying and true. Okay. Uh, so I feel confident in saying I'm a practicing Buddhist because it means I am learning. I'm transitioning. I'm getting better and worse every day, right? It depends on the day. It depends on my situation. Sometimes I'm really good at compassion. And sometimes I think I wish you weren't in front of me, <laughs> right? So think about this. Again, the advice is to practice loving kindness meditation for compassion. You need to begin by generating feelings of compassion for yourself, then your loved ones, could be a human, could be a pet, right? Could be a neighbor, just, you know, your loved ones, neutral people, people you see at the store, that kind person that checks you out at Rayleigh's, they always smile at you. They're like, oh, good job buying asparagus. Yeah, I'm trying to eat healthy, right? Then move on to the difficult people in life. 
right? Whether that's difficult people that you work with, whether that's difficult people that you live with, whether that's difficult people that live on your street, whether that's difficult people that are in our government, whether that's difficult people who you elected to office, right? There is no shortage of difficult people, right? So move on. Remember, start with yourself, loved ones, neutral, then difficult people, right? And it's interesting because uh, Pema Chodron suggests the practice of Tonglen, also known as sending and taking. I personally call it black and white breathing because it's easy for me to remember. But this is another form of meditation, in addition to the loving kindness meditation, that offers a way for us to facilitate compassion for others. Pema Chodron states that in the Tonglen practice, we visualize taking in the pain of others with every in-breath and then sending out whatever will benefit them on the out-breath. And then we begin to feel love for both ourselves and others, and we begin to take care of ourselves and others. I think about it in simpler terms than her, but you know, she's a master practitioner. I'm a simple practitioner. I think about it as in I'm taking in something that's tangible. I imagine breathing in black smoke out of somebody who's having difficulty. I imagine all their difficulties just get placed in black smoke, which they expel. And then I breathe it in and I take in white radiant light from the earth and then I expel it out. And then I imagine that it zooms off of me out into space, never to return. I know. I'm super visual. <laughs> but two good practices for compassion, right? Remembering that you start here and then you radiate it out, right? Easy to go from you to people that you love, things that you love, right? Animals, you know, even little planties, right? Things that you love, then go to neutral, then go to difficult. But start with the easy and if I said start with the easy in your head, you went, myself? Yeah, start there, start there, right? Okay, let's go to sympathetic joy, three of the four. Sympathetic joy is a positive mental state that can be cultivated in which you delight in the positive experiences of others without jealousy or envy. I know. Hold on. Cultivating this mind state is the opposite of jealousy and envy. And by practicing the joy for the happiness of others, we can reduce our own attachment and also reduce unhelpful comparison. Right? We all do that. Gain an open-hearted and compassionate attitude and deepen our awareness of the interconnection of all beings. So this is what I'm asking of you. When someone shares something amazing or they're super over the moon excited about it, they're super, super happy, and you hear it and you go, hmm, nice, <laughs> right? Or you're like, I don't have a car that, that's nice. I don't have a house that nice. I don't have shoes that nice, right? We do. We do the comparing mind, right? Or we're like, hmm, good for you. I mean, I'm smiling. I'm showing teeth. Is that growling? Okay, that's growling, right? We do it. We all do it. So I say, watch your mind when someone shares something delightful in their life. What do you tell yourself? Ask yourself, are you or can you be genuinely happy for another person's bit of good news? If not, just be honest. No one's asking you. We're not, you know, giving you a test. But if you hear someone's really good news and you're like, good for you, right? Just say, oh, oh, that was not sympathetic joy. Just call it what it is. That is not sympathetic joy. And then if you really can't get to a positive mind, try to get to a neutral mind, right? Neutral is better than negative. So try to get to a neutral mind and say, okay, I was just going to comparing mind. I do not have a house that nice. I'm feeling all grouchy on the inside. I am going to say, 
and permanence. I do not have a house that nice right now. That's neutral, right? And if you're still struggling, think about how you would feel if you could share that news. You would get super excited inside, right? You're like, you check out my house. Well, you know, think about how it feels if it happened to you and then transfer that good feeling in you that you generated to the other person, right? Transfer that to Jen. Transfer that to Charles, right? Generate it here and then let it go. That'll help you with sympathetic joy. Keep it right here. Remember, it's part of your house. All right, let's jump into equanimity. Yeah, we're doing perfect on time. Equanimity is developed over time by meditation and mindfulness practice, and it refers to a profound quality of strength and evenness of mind, undisturbed by emotional upheavals. Equanimity is the state of balance, calmness, and non-reactivity toward the changing conditions of life. This means truly accepting all things as happening to us, positive and negative, success and failure, with an even-minded attitude. Equanimity allows us to respond to situations with clarity, wisdom, and impartiality. Truly the ability to respond and not react. We don't meditate to become better meditators. I mean, okay, sort of we do, right? But really we meditate so that we learn how to quiet the mind so that when something comes, we're like, I see it and I'm going to what? Respond and not react. That's the difference. That pause that you can create for yourself, right? It's that pause you want to create. Okay, so now that I've gotten us through those four, I'm going to tell us what to do daily in the heat of the moment. And as this is Father's Day, I would be remiss if I did not give us a dadism. Are you ready? Here's a dadism. This is from my dad. Be ready so you never have to get ready. <laughs> right? Doesn't that sound like every dad ever? I know I love it. He would say it to us all the time. But let's Let's, let's go back to the beginning of my talk. Remember that I think of these divine abodes, right? The best home from Sharon Salzberg. I think of it as a snail shell, something uh, because I want to keep it with me all the time. I don't want to have it as a nice home that I walk away from and I go to work or I go to the Capitol or whatever, and then I go back. No, I got to take that little home with me because these virtuous qualities contribute not only to my personal happiness, harmonious relationships, but they benefit all beings, right? It's me and then everyone else's life that I touch. So if I'm engaging in an active practice and I can cultivate these qualities through meditation, reflection, daily mindfulness practices, I'm aiming to expand their capacity for love, compassion, joy, and equanimity everywhere I go, everywhere I go, because I've got my little four Brahma Viharas in my little snail shell. So here's some daily things. Are you ready? We're going to get to the how, the do of Buddhism. So we all know Rinpoche said to us probably a bazillion million times by now, meditate every day. Do it for 24 minutes. How many people in here were like, what? 24? <laughs> Hopefully no one. <laughs> it's 24 minutes, right? Do something if you can't do 24 minutes. Think about something that you habitually do and then attach meditation to it. I freely admit to you, these last three weeks have been a whirlwind of activity in my life, trying to do my job, trying to pack, trying to move, trying to do all these things together. And so, and even then I fell off on doing something that I normally do six days a week, which is walk five miles, right? So when I was really having trouble before, when Rinpoche first mentioned this, I was like, oh, I'm not meditating 24 minutes a day. So what I did was I took my little bone conduction headphones and I didn't turn them on. I would check my watch, leave the house, and I figured out how long it took me to walk 24 minutes. And then I would walk and meditate for 24 minutes. And then I'm like, this is ridiculous. 
I can get my rear out of bed half an hour earlier. Goodness sakes, brush my teeth, meditate, seated, and then walk. So I did that, right? But there's a way to always work in meditation. And even if you can't do 24 minutes together, break it up, do 12 and 12, right? Break it up, but do it. So uh, there you go. So I talked to you earlier about visual cues in your daily environment. And I'm going to tell you, uh, I have two other cues I can give you, but I'll, I'll just concentrate on one since I always love that they're in the windowsill over there. So I have a small Buddha statue and I keep it on my desk. I keep it right on my desk. And then what I do is when I want to send a heated email, right, I can feel it. I can feel the flames forming in my fingers and I'm going to be like, you once again, right? right? I can feel it. I pause on the keyboard and I look at my little Buddha statue and I'm like, okay, body, speech, and mind. That's not good. Right? The other thing I do is I change quotes on my laptop. I keep little quotes down taped in the corner of my laptop. And so I move my right hand, I read it. Maybe I won't send that email, right? I also keep it there because as everyone knows, we're working from home partially, some of us still. And when I have my screen up and it's Zoom or Teams, right? And I lean back, I'll be like, again, is what I think in my head. And I'm just getting ready to say something. And then I glance down, I've trained myself, look in that right corner. And I look in that right corner and guess what I have in there right now? a quote from the Dalai Lama on my precious human life. And I think, I don't know how many eons, I don't know how many eons of karma it took me to get to this precious human life. But I know that if I let that blistering thought come off my tongue, that's going to be getting me a lot less closer to a precious human life. <laughs> right? So it's the practice. It's the practice, right, daily. So I try to be mindful of my body, speech, and mind, and usually I make better decisions by having these things in my visual field. I say usually because I'm being honest and because I'm practicing. I'm a student. I'm practicing. But let's sip through a few more things, and then we're going to get to the super fun part of today, which you are like, oh, dear. Ready? So let's think about some things that we can do for loving kindness. When I'm really in a heated moment, and I've had a lot of heated moments over a very particular bill these last few weeks, I think about loving kindness. And if I can't even get to a Buddhist state because it's happening in my face, right? Uh, I think of this. At the bare minimum, I think everyone wants to be loved and treated well. And I have a serious fondness for Winnie the Pooh because my brother, who was eight years older than me, used to always give up on his own playtime to come downstairs and to read me Winnie the Pooh. And even when it was in the summer and it was super light outside and my bedtime was when it was light because I was the youngest, I just hated it. And my brother would always come in and read Winnie the Pooh to me. So I have a lot of Winnie the Pooh quotes in my head, which I think is kind of actually secretly Buddhist, I'm just going to say. So I often think of A.A. A. Maline and the wisdom that he imparted in the Winnie the Pooh books. And one of them is, I think, just because an animal is large, it doesn't mean he doesn't want kindness. However big Tigger seems to be, remember that he wants as much kindness as Rue. Remember Tigger, boing, 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 and then little Roo was the little kangaroo baby, right? I insert whatever needs to work for me there. Largeness, gruffness, meanness, outright hostility, anger, whatever it is that this person or thing is doing to me, I think they still want as much kindness as Roo, right? So at their core, Everyone still wants to be loved. They still want to be understood. And everything that's happened to me in my life, guess what? I still believe in love. I believe in myself. 
for love. I believe in everyone in here for love. I still believe in love, even though things haven't gone as I've imagined. That's okay. Love will still transcend. And if someone is treating me in an unloving, unkind way, I also do this. What Rinpoche was like, dang. I imagine them as my kind mother. This person's yelling in my face or doing whatever, and I think to myself, at some point, not now, you were my kind mother. You took care of me. You fed me. You clothed me. You bathed me. You cared for me so that I'm here now. I get it. We're not on the same side right now, but at some point you were my kind mother. And you know, my mom and I had a difficult relationship. So sometimes I think of this person as my kind father. <laughs> and it's Father's Day. And my dad and I have a really great relationship. So I just think, you are my kind mother. Nope, still not working for me. You are my kind dad. Oh, now I got it. Now I can generate all those feelings, right? Okay. If you can do nothing else in that moment for loving kindness, just remember that very basic fact that everybody wants to be loved and treated well, no matter their current state, no matter their current behavior. And think this, impermanence. What they're doing right now is impermanent. It will not last. All right, let's jump through the last three. Compassion. Remember, we talked about it. You have to offer self-compassion first to you. I say these things to myself. Are you ready? I literally say, wow, this is bad. <laughs> it's okay. This is truly suffering. All right. May I remember to be kind to myself in this moment and remember to offer myself compassion. I've had some uniquely tough days these last three weeks. And I literally stop and I'm like, this is bad. This is really suffering. All right, let me offer self-compassion to myself. Just takes a second. Now I've been away, from, you know, I've been moving and packing, so I'm able to just stop and like do it. But even in your head, you can just do it, right? You can just take a little mental break from what's happening and just be like, this is suffering. <laughs> To take a little break here and be like, it's okay. I'm going to offer compassion to myself. The other thing is, I think, for compassion, I think, what do I have in common with this person? What common ground do we share? And I only speak or act after I have thought of a commonality. Sometimes what I'm trying to do for adolescent sexual health is in direct opposition to somebody else. And so I sometimes have to zoom all the way up to 30,000 feet and think, we both care for kids. Okay, let's start there. <laughs> That's enough for right now, right? That's enough. I see that you and I have something common. Sympathetic joy. Oh, I wish I could tell you there's a shortcut, but honestly, it's just practice, 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 right? Just as I stated above, you need to watch your mind. And when someone shares something positive, if that negativity starts to arise in you or the comparison mind, that's okay. It's okay. Just note it. Don't let it go by. Don't let it ignore it. Don't push it away. Say, I see you, comparison mind. Welcome to the party. Have a seat, right? I see you, negative mind, right? Note it and then try to refocus to a neutral state. And then super duper huge bonus points from going from a negative mind to a positive mind. But that's like, that's like chef's kiss, right? That's bonus points. Just try to get to a neutral mind. Even if you just call it out, well, I'm comparing myself to them. I shouldn't. I am my own person. Equanimity. Sometimes in that heated moment, I think you are just the same as me. You are just the same as me. No matter what you're currently saying or what you're doing, I think you are just the same as me. You want everything I want. You want to be loved. You want to be safe. Right? You want to be hugged. You want to be held. You want all the things I want. 
It's okay. I also quickly flip back into loving kindness or compassion because that gets me to those two practices that I'm familiar with, my kind mother slash father and common ground, right? All right. We have perfect. We have just a couple of minutes. So I'm going to ask you all to do something. Are you ready? Someone's got to move. Find a friend. Y'all are sitting together. Good for you. Okay. So find a friend. Find pairs of twos. Find pairs of ones. I mean, pairs of threes. Triads of threes. Pairs of ones. Lordy, somebody help me get some coffee. So pairs of pairs of two, pairs of two, pairs of three. Triads, triads. Everyone got somebody? Okay, I'll come join in just a sec. Ready? Okay. So take a few moments to pair up with another Lions Roar Sangha member. Introduce yourselves if you don't know each other already. And then after hearing this about the Brahma Viharas, share some very practical ways that you practice the four Brahma Viharas in your daily life. Even if you don't think that you do, you do. So I'm just going to give you a few moments. So introduce yourselves, think of something you can share, and then we're going to come back and I'm going to close this out. All right, just giving you a couple of minutes. All right, everybody, we'll give you about another 30 seconds and I count fast. So it's really going to be 15. Remember, the only thing I do with a snail is my shell. Everything else, I'm a little speedy, speedy. All right. I'm going to ask if anybody wants to share one thing. Anybody want to share one thing that you and your triad, your dyad spoke about? And if you don't want to, that's okay. But if you do, anyone want to share one thing that they're going to say, I'm going to walk away from today and I'm going to do that. Monet, you want to do it? I'm sorry. Ona is going to start us in the beginning again. Don't worry, everybody online. Here we go. Hello. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying that um, on my phone, I have like rotating images that change every hour of like a quote or like an image that helps to remind me to be present. Um, just, just because I know that I tend to look at my phone often. And usually when it's on the lock screen, I'm like, oh, what is it? Um, for example, I have a quote right now that says, what is for you won't go past you. So things like that to remind me to kind of like be grounded and not get caught up in all of this, the world. Since I was shouting out orders, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I said, please. Uh, something that a couple of us have in common is not getting up early in the morning and rushing um, and giving a moment to, to take pause, as they say, and get centered. Yeah. That was it. Better? Okay. Thank you for sharing. And actually, thank you for doing that. 
It's called Turn, Pair, Share in the educational community. And uh, one of the reasons why you do it is actually to build community. You do it so that we get a chance to sit and talk with each other. And it's not just so, you know, one-sided, right? Coming from me out to y'all is that we need to recognize and rely on and know that we each know more than we think we know. And so it's good to talk to your sangha, right, brothers and sisters, and say, this is what I do. What do you do? This is what I do. What do you do? Because we can learn a lot from each other. All right. So in closing, we're going to close this pupper out. In closing, ultimately, the four Brahma Viharas are qualities that can be developed and practiced, thus changing the heart and the mind and giving us a framework to cultivate positive behaviors and to minimize harmful ones not only for ourselves, but for every life that we touch in our daily, weekly, monthly, yearly existence. Think about how many people we touch. Finally, I think about this quote a lot too. Chandrakirti in The Guide in the Middle Way states, oops, that's another book I forgot to give you all as a reference. Chandrakirti states, an undisciplined state of mind gives rise to delusions that propel an individual into negative action, which then creates the negative environment in which the person lives. I don't want to live there. That is not where I want to live. Right? Do you? No. Right? We don't want to have that undisciplined state of mind that just keeps continuously giving rise to delusions and then propelling us forward into negative action, which then creates that whole negative environment, and then that's where we are. I don't want that. So I practice the four Brahma Viharas. I keep them right here, right there, my best home, right? My four abodes. I keep them right there so that I can access them all the time. So there you have it. Buddhism in the streets, as I called it, or how to stay calm in the face of adversity. How to stay calm in the face of adversity? You practice those and you make sure that you have them accessible. And even if you can't get to Buddhism, look to something that you can get even if it's Winnie the Pooh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sharla. That was fabulous. Really, so so much wisdom to take forward today. Yes. One second, I gotta get caught up on, on the same song sheet here. Uh, we'll do dedication now. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has not arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rays of Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, and fading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Uh, let's see, um, some announcements. Um, Susan, do you have any announcements? I'm a little... Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little next weekend yeah what do we want to say about next weekend we have another teacher is it Kenshin Rinpoche Kenshin Rinpoche is coming um and 
was unprepared to Unze today, so I have not prepared my thoughts. Um, what is he, do we know what he's teaching on? Would you like to? <laughs> You're welcome. Run from me. All right. Let me look. Um, I'm like going to look for my email real quick. So I think he's teaching Saturday, right? Okay. So next weekend, and we are like totally not sure. So I hope you all get the roar, the weekly announcement. <laughs> Because that will have it, and Charla is looking it up, yay for sure. Um, but there is a a teacher coming by the name of Ten Kenshin Rinpoche. Um, he has known Lama Jimpa for many, many, many years, and um, he speaks really good English, but he's not real comfortable teaching in English. So we'll have a translator, but he also will add in English. He is just the most charming and knowledgeable and kind individual you will ever meet and he's teaching saturday and sunday next week and i think sunday is going to be have you got it okay <laughs> i think uh sunday he'll be teaching on uh, a very traditional text called um the verses the 400 verses by uh oh, I don't know, Arya Deva, maybe fourth or sixth century, something like that. It's a very traditional text, um, but it's also very down to earth and very foundational. So it'll be a really good teaching on Sunday. I don't know what he's teaching on on Saturday, but I think he's, hmm? That's what we're trying to look up because nobody has it in their heads. So... Huh? So there'll be more announcements that will go out. And if you are not on our email list, um, see either Jen or me, and we can show you how to get on the email list. But 22nd, uh, Saturday at 2 p.m. And June 23rd at 11 a.m. There we go. Yeah. Anyway. Got it. And as always, um, uh, your donations are greatly appreciated to help keep the lights on and the air, pay the air conditioning bill and so forth. So um, also next week, there'll be a potluck. So please uh, bring a dish to share. And uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Charla. Om <laughs> Om